Hey guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we're quite literally shifting the way we think about the future. Today, we've definitely got somebody doing that and shifting the way we think about ourselves as well. Dr. David Perlmutter on the program. Thanks for coming today, David. I'm delighted to be here. I have been uh, called a disruptor since childhood. So uh, now it's, it's it has taken on, I guess, a positive connotation. I'm happy that it finally caught up. Interesting. I feel like there's a story or two here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, were, you I think, a, were you a troublesome one? I was. I, I'm, I'll admit it. I was a, a real pain. Sure, I re- absolutely was disruptive. So there you go. And now you're still doing it today, shifting, uh, shifting the healthcare industry a, a fair bit. You've done a you've done a lot of work looking at how diet and specifically what we eat, our gut microbiome, impact essentially who we are. Can you take me through our background, your background, a little bit, and then we'll dive deeper. Sure, and I, I think that many of your viewers will probably conclude that my background doesn't necessarily lend itself perfectly uh, to being one who is able to stand on firm ground as it relates to these concepts, but hopefully I can prove otherwise. So my background is one that is very steeped in the neurosciences, studying the brain. Um, I began doing that research when I was around 18, uh, and um became a physician ultimately specialized in first neurosurgery then neurology and as a practicing neurologist over the years during my first 10 years of practice i became really disenchanted with the fact that we weren't really helping people Uh, and when we were it was really only in terms of symptom management so i began to explore what it is uh, in the brain and the nervous system uh, that seems to go wrong when we see these chronic degenerative conditions, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, et cetera. And I realized that there was quite a bit of literature out there that uh, was really very much focused on lifestyle choices relating to brain health and brain destiny. And that no one was, uh, from the clinical perspective, no one was making the connection and talking about it. So I realized that's something that needed to happen. And so I began to uh, study these relationships, uh, food, sleep, exercise, stress, and began to lecture about those issues. I think one of the best, way to, best ways to learn about something is to have somebody present you with a deadline for a lecture. Then when you get up there, you realize you, you really have to know your stuff because there's going to be a Q&A period. So that really forced me to begin to develop a good foundation in the understanding of lifestyle choices as they relate to the brain. And I found over the next 30 years that, well, I guess the next 25 years, that um, it was a pretty lonely area that no one was really talking about the role of lifestyle choices as they relate to brain health and brain destiny, while we were seeing a lot of literature and books being published that related lifestyle choices, for example, to heart disease, some relationship to cancer, certainly osteoporosis in women, why they needed weight-bearing exercise, et cetera. But Brain health was very much left out of that conversation. And uh, what I learned, which was really quite interesting, is that the brain is probably more responsive to appropriate lifestyle choices than any other part of the body. And I think everybody who's a specialist defends their area, and I'm willing to go there. And what I learned, I think, that will pave the way for that uh, relationship is that, in fact, this notion of the brain relating to lifestyle choices, the, the statement that I just made, is really a bit off base because it's the brain through the lens of other bodily systems. For example, the gastrointestinal system and the gastrointestinal function is intimately related to how the brain works moment to moment and how the brain will uh, adapt to age. Uh, what will our risk be for chronic degenerative conditions, for example? So the notion that I, as a brain specialist, would therefore need to interact with gastroenterologists, uh, the other specialists in this uh, story, uh, was a little bit compelling. I mean, what did I have to uh, say or or learn from gastroenterologists? And it turns out that what I learned uh, was by and large not what gastroenterologists could teach me. It was more uh, learning from the perspective of the researchers less from those who are doing clinical work because uh, the idea that, for example, digestion and digestive metabolites from our gut bacteria would affect the brain 
uh, I think was not typically, in my opinion, what the typical uh, clinical gastroenterologists were really interested in, which I thought was really quite uh, compelling. But nonetheless, that developed this relationship between, for example, gut bacteria and the health and functionality of the human brain. Wow. You talk about being uh, far off from your original level of training. That really took me to the ends of the world. I mean, that would be about as far as a, a disparate, uh, disparate area of research as I could have imagined. So, but it turned out that um, the goings on of the gut momentarily and uh, with long-term consequences have a dramatic effect upon the brain. And uh, that led to further study of uh, what the gut bacteria do and how what it is that they do affect the brain. And therefore, uh, writing books and research papers about that, lecturing about that, and having the opportunity over more recent years to interact with people really at the top of their game in terms of this very burgeoning, new but burgeoning uh, area of research, the human gut uh, microbiome. And what a story uh, that has that has told, uh, been told with reference to uh, opening a new playing field for us as clinicians being able to help people, but really opening the doors to so many areas of research uh, all of a sudden that we could never have conceived of uh, even a decade ago. Why is it that we couldn't have conceived of it a decade ago when it's been, it feels like it's been common knowledge, or at least the wives' tale, that the the lizard brain in your gut influences a lot of our subconscious processing. Why did we not make that leap? I think there are a lot of uh, reasons for that. I mean, uh, we were inculcated with the idea that germs were bad, uh, you know, as a holdover from uh, Louis Pasteur's work, and that has been pervasive uh, throughout the medical industry. Uh, since that time, even through my medical training and un until quite recently, that germs were looked upon as being uh, uh, something that we would want to combat. We would want to uh, be very grateful for the fact that there are hand sanitizers at the end of the on the end caps at, uh, in the aisle of every grocery store, and that we've got to protect our children from dangerous bugs that lurk and seek to uh, destroy our lives. So it's taking uh, uh, scientists uh, less time, but clinicians, I think, more time with embracing the notion that by and large, we have co-evolved over millions and millions of years uh, with this group of organisms that live within us, forming what's called basically a meta-organism, that we're not who we think we are, but we're this, you know, this uh, amalgamation of living things that, that cohabitate this space. Uh, that brings about an or a meta organism that then is really in a hopefully a great state of symbiosis. Uh, you know, the gut was uh, known to be populated with bacteria that were basically looked upon as being targets for sterilization, and in fact, were the recipients of vigorous sterilization as we over the years have absolutely abused antibiotics and uh, have recognized these days the consequences of our total disregard for embracing the notion uh, that the body isn't a reductionist uh, compilation of disparate parts, but rather is very much a symbiotic holistic uh, organism or meta-organism, not just in terms of our organ systems relating to each other, but in terms of our relationships with uh, the gut microbes that are manufacturing products that are moment to moment affecting our thoughts, affecting our moods, affecting our choices, and directing our behavior such that they can cultivate the most uh, beneficial environment for themselves. When we appreciate that relationship, we can harvest that understanding and leverage lifestyle choices that can be beneficial for us through the lens of our gut bacteria. It's really it's very compelling and extremely empowering. Basically, it's a symbiotic, uh, parasitic relationship where everybody wins if uh, you well, play the game parasitic, right. Parasitic, usually there's only one it's winner. I'd say more symbiotic. And, you know, I, I, I say to audiences that, um, for example, we tell women when they're pregnant to be careful what you eat now because you're eating for two. Well, Matt, you are eating for 100 billion right now. 
So they're going to eat what you eat. If you eat a fiber poor, high sugar diet with poor quality fat, then your gut bacteria are going to do things that are not going to pave the way for you to be healthy. If on the other hand, you have created a diet that emulates the diet of our ancestors, which is really high in fiber, has very good levels of healthful fat, uh, this will uh, instigate changes in your gut bacteria whereby they can create various chemicals in your body that are good for you, B vitamins, certain short chain fatty acids, they will keep, for example, your gut lining from becoming permeable and therefore decrease inflammation, which is really very, very important when we recognize that inflammation is the cornerstone of things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and diabetes and cancer. So they're going to keep their environment uh, going because it's in their interest and uh, that's in your interest as well. And to clarify some of the mechanisms here, so a large part of our understanding based off of how a lot of these diseases we would typically have categorized as genetic diseases, i.e., well, shit, you're going to get it anyways. They're epigenetic in terms of inflammation or specific environmental factors turn on whether or not you get cancer, whether or not you have it at 47 or 107. Is that a basic summary of the science to date, at least for what we understand? Uh, I think that where you're taking this converse conversation is away from the notion of genetic determinism to a, a place of genetic predisposition. And uh, certainly, um, you know, as it relates to the things we've been talking about, that's a valid platform uh, for us to continue our conversation. There are some things that are genetically determined uh, that are pretty much genetically hardwired. But we have come to an understanding now that uh, those issues are far less uh, involved in the greater scope of diseases that we face uh, globally uh, than uh, the ones that are highly influenced by our choices. Let me give you an example. We know that there is a certain genetic predisposition for Alzheimer's, for example, and it's called carrying the APOE4 gene allele. And that is an allele that is carried by 20 to 22 percent, for example, of Americans, meaning that they have, if they have one copy of it, they are, have a, about a five-fold increased risk for Alzheimer's. And if they have two copies of it, their risk for Alzheimer's is increased 12-fold. But what we now understand is uh, research shows that that risk can be downplayed or reduced when individuals take on certain lifestyle changes, for example, exercise. Uh, individuals who engage in exercise have demonstrated to have a, a reduction uh, in Alzheimer's risk, even though they may carry the APOE4 allele. Now, we, carrying you know this why allele is? is something you're going to learn from um, getting your 23andMe. Uh, and I think you know people say, gee, I don't want to know. Well, why wouldn't you want to know? If you know, you can be uh, extra judicious about an anti-Alzheimer's program and do your very best to prevent that disease for which there is no treatment. Let me just add one point, because I think it'll emphasize where we can take this conversation. Just uh, several weeks ago, uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association published a report that described uh, long-term usage of Alzheimer's drugs uh, that are on the market, uh, with the understanding, first of all, that the research has shown that these drugs that are marketed uh, and sold to the tune of close to a billion dollars annually uh, for Alzheimer's disease. We know they don't work, A. But this new research just published shows that not only do they not work, but they speed the cognitive decline in the people who are taking drugs ostensibly to slow their rate of cognitive decline. I, I believe that is breathtaking. The very drug that people are putting their faith into uh, and giving to mom or dad or husband or wife or whomever that the doctor has written as a prescription have now been shown in the Journal of the American Medical Association to actually speed their cognitive decline. They're worsening over time. So why do studies like this not appear on the evening news and on the front page of the New York Times or wherever else? I'll leave that to others to discuss, but the point is we're, I'm making it known now to, to your audience, and uh, I think it's really important information. 
I think it is as well. And you can always look at where the incentives are. Where there's money, there's funding. And where there's not funding, there's not publicity. There's a reason why some we have enough idiots who believe in climate change that uh, don't believe in climate change. Sorry, let, oh, me, let me correct that. Let me correct that. Who don't believe in climate change. Very well, I, clear I, here. I don't call them idiots. I, I call them uh, individuals who have a different viewpoint, a different perspective. I, I don't know the earth might be flat. Uh, I am 99.9% .9 sure that it's not. But um, I think that it's important to listen to the viewpoints of others. And uh, I've been proven wrong many, many times. I mean, if we would be doing this podcast uh, 18 to 20 years ago, I'd be advocating a low-fat diet. I don't do that anymore. I advocate a high-fat diet. So I think it's, it's really important to embrace the views of others. Uh, and I, I find it very difficult at times. Uh, I don't know uh, what those things are behind the jet liners that go overhead. I think it's, uh, you know, it's ice crystals that are formed. Others may have views on that. So, uh, but that said, uh, I, I have to say that at this stage in my life, I have, re uh, I have uh, come to a place that I do think I, I, ha I personally have to talk about climate change because it impacts health. And I believe that it's very, very real. And I believe... Uh, as best as I can determine that human activity is having a major impact on climate change. Uh, I'm experiencing it where I live. I don't know who's not experiencing it on this planet. So, um, you know, I, I've, uh, I'm out there uh, happy to discuss that. The interesting thing is we would be in an ice age right now if it wasn't for human, human uh, pollution. So we've shifted the, we've shifted the, fall very far into the other direction. I want to go into the personalized health and medicine side of things, though. So I I know a, a lot of us were raised on low fat, low fat, low fat. Let's switch that out for whatever we can. The next thing became gluten free because we had celiac disease. And it was a very small percentage. So suddenly everything became gluten free. My aunt has celiac and so does my cousin. So they have to avoid anything with wheat or gluten. And it becomes very restrictive. How do we think about diet and health recommendations on a personalized basis? Because it isn't something that is a black and there's very few things that are black and white that people can agree on other than sugar is terrible for you. Okay, good, good entree there. Uh, so we'll get to personalized uh, uh, recommendations in medicine, but you just mentioned a broad stroke. And uh, if we can paint the broad strokes for the population in general, that can have a lot of traction if people just make changes based upon a couple of recommendations. Number one, you hit the nail on the head, that sugar should be avoided. Number two, we need higher levels of dietary fiber. Number three, the human body requires dietary fat. Uh, and number four, uh, by and large, uh, the types of carbohydrates we are consuming today are not necessarily good for us, with the exception of dietary fiber, uh, which is, by definition, carbohydrate. So those are broad strokes that everyone, I believe, can and should embrace. Uh, when you get to more specific recommendations, as we move to the middle of the list, we talk about things like uh, meat and dairy and uh, the gluten-free recommendations. And, you know, to be sure, I think that the, the science has been quite clear that there are individuals who, though they don't have celiac disease, which would represent about 1.4 percent of people uh, who, who do have celiac disease, there are plenty of people who have non-celiac gluten sensitivity, as was published last year uh, by Harvard researchers in the Journal of the American Medical Association. So we know but there are a large number of people who shouldn't eat gluten because they have reactions to this very uh, strange protein that humans haven't been exposed to until basically yesterday in, in human evolution uh, with the advent of agriculture. So we don't really have a genetic uh, makeup that would allow us to be cool with uh, gluten. Uh, but that said, there is this notion of personalized medicine where we take the individual and do our very best to determine what are the lifestyle, well beyond nutrition, what are the lifestyle recommendations for that individual based on as many biometrics as we can uh, establish. 
We look at that individual's DNA using simple testing that's available to all of us these days, which is pretty exciting that we can sequence your DNA for $100 uh, and you do it online by sending in a saliva specimen. Who ever thought? Uh, that we will look at your microbiome, your, your gut uh, bacteria, their RNA, their uh, metabolic products. Uh, we will look at where you live, when you live there, uh, your pedigree, uh, your body metrics, uh, your height, weight, blood sugar, insulin resistance markers, et cetera. And then from that information, cultivate a program that is very math specific. What do you need? And I think there's a lot of uh, validity there's a lot of uh, health benefits to doing that. Uh, it's not anything that can happen necessarily on a global scale with large populations uh, because of cost and time factors. But I think that for those individuals who have the ability to make that happen and are able to interact with somebody who's able to interpret that data and come up with good recommendations, uh, then uh, it, can, it can very well be paving the way for a home run. And there are various companies now that are out there uh, doing their best to take the data that they are given or that they will help accumulate for you and then uh, create a program that would be specific for your needs. Um, but I would say that um, even, there are a lot of this that can be done on your own. You can take your 23andMe data, uh, upload it from 23andMe using your own password onto your desktop, and then download that to multiple sites uh, on the internet that will then give you a program or, or at least some recommendations based upon your DNA findings that you would not have known before. Let me just give you uh, one example for, uh, to, to consider. Part of your DNA will look at uh, mild variances uh, in your genes that are involved in um, what is called MTHFR. <laughs> Methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. I'm sure many of your viewers have looked up MTHFR and looked at YouTube videos. And it basically what it means is how does your body handle B vitamins? Uh, we, uh, we have a process in our bodies called methylation that is important for detoxification, for antioxidant function, for uh, working with how we uh, are able to utilize various neurotransmitters, for example. Uh, how we generate um, something called glutathione, which is involved in detoxification and uh, reducing free radicals, et cetera. So we really need this methylation process. It also has to do with gene expression as well. And about uh, 20 to 25% of Americans have variations in a set of genes that are involved in this. And you get that information when you do a 23andMe. And you find out how effectively you methylate. And I, I, for example, learned about myself that I'm a really crappy methylator. Here, I have to, I'm being very transparent with you. I am a poor methylator, meaning uh, that I carry some of these gene uh, variations that indicate that I don't do that process very well. What's the action then? What can I do to remedy that? Now that I know it, now that personalized medicine has given me that information, it means instead of taking B-complex vitamins, I take methylated B-complex, methylated folate, uh, methylated B6, methylated B12, et cetera, so that I bypass this, I hate to say defect because it's so condescending or uh, derogatory towards myself, but I bypass this nuance of my genome uh, that uh, I would not have known about had I not had my genome sequence. So that really is a, a, a a, uh, an example of this notion of personalized medicine. Beyond that, knowing your, um, your genome allows you to understand how well you metabolize or respond to uh, certain medications, uh, how you handle coffee, how you handle alcohol, uh, what level of activity you should engage in, why you should pay more attention to sleep, etc. So it's good information to have, and that's what what personalized medicine is, is all about. I tend in my outreach not to focus as much on personalized medicine, but to focus more on the broad strokes to broader populations. So um, several months ago, I had the opportunity to, to uh, lecture at 
uh, the World Bank and International Monetary Fund. Uh, and that was simulcasted to 50 sites around the globe. And while the purpose of my lecture was really sort of centered upon the economic impact of brain degenerative conditions, obviously World Bank, they want to know about that. It was really focused on the notion of preventive medicine as it relates to keeping the brain healthy. And in that, we talk about these broad stroke ideas that we've mentioned, the sugar, carbohydrates, fat, uh, other things, exercise, so undervalued, but uh, really hugely important as it relates to the brain. And talked about if we could implement these dietary changes and the, the understanding of the role of exercise, the value of restorative sleep in terms of being preventive for things like Alzheimer's disease, a disease currently costing the globe a trillion dollars annually, more than the market cap of Apple, for example, and Google, for example. Uh, you know, you put it in those in that perspective, people begin to take notice, especially in third world countries uh, that are at the highest risk for having, you know, a, an incredible explosion of this epidemic of Alzheimer's disease that not only has economic impact, but emotional impact as well, but also serves to de degrade the brain functionality, the cognitive functionality of the global population at large in lockstep with increasing obesity and increasing rates of diabetes, which are directly related. So, um, you know, my mission, I think, is to really get out there with more of the broad stroke understandings of things that we can do that are easier than having your genome sequenced and getting your microbiome teased apart, et cetera. And for some of these, for some people listening, these topics might be a little bit out there. So I wanna, I wanna hammer this home with two things. A, if you put medicine in your mouth and it, affects you, that kind of clarifies the fact that something that goes in your mouth can transform the way you feel and think. But then I, I listened to a video you did about air pollution and its effect on IQ. And I think it also, it also brings home the point of what your body takes in, the toxins, your environment can directly impact you, your performance and your life quality. So can you bring that up for a bit? Certainly. Uh, and you know, there are multiple straws on this camel's back. Uh, and uh, nutrition plays a huge role. Uh, lifestyle choices that relate to our quality of sleep, or the amount of exercise we get, important as well. The food we eat, we mentioned, the water we drink and its purity, very important, and even the air we breathe. So uh, the research that, uh, I, I'm not sure which podcast you're talking about, but the research that's come to light has demonstrated that when we're uh, exposed to higher levels of these 2.5 uh, particles that are uh, measured uh, by researchers, the higher exposure correlates to higher levels of inflammatory changes in the brain, increased production of chemicals called cytokines, higher risk for dementia, and lowered IQ. One interesting study that took place in Toronto measured the distance uh, that people lived uh, from a major highway, a major thoroughfare. And the levels of these uh, inflammatory chemicals in the brain uh, correlated with the distance you lived uh, closer or further from the highway. So again, it's, it, you know, there's a relation. The closer you live to a highway, the higher levels of pollution you will experience. So yes, it is even the air that we breathe. And uh, I learned this summer that that's something you can't necessarily get away from. I mean, you can choose to go to the health food store and buy organic food. It's interesting. Why do we say health food store? That there are these unique stores that carry food that somehow is going to relate to health? Have you ever wondered uh, how crazy that uh, idea is? That Well, what does the other store carry then if it's not a health food store? We'll leave that up in the air. But I learned this summer that while we were traveling on a boat, we could bring good foods with us. We could make uh, wonderful water to drink out of the ocean through reverse osmosis, but we couldn't get away from the smoke, from the burning of Vancouver, North, uh, from Vancouver Island and from all across uh, British Columbia. And certainly everybody saw that in California, uh, that the air was full of smoke and there's nowhere to go, there's nowhere to hide. I mean, yeah, we could uh, live our lives wearing M95 uh, masks, but, um, you know, clearly, Matt, it gets back to our discussion of climate change. 
This is very, very real. And again, you can get away from certain things. You can choose not to eat processed uh, food that has pesticides so far these days. Uh, but you know, what are you gonna do when you can't breathe the air anymore uh, where you live? I guess you can move and we're gonna run out of places uh, to go. You know, uh, as we are recording this podcast right now, we're at the tail end of the, all of the excitement about the, uh, the refugees who made their way from Guatemala up to uh, Tijuana uh, and that we are, for whatever reason, they're, they're held in Mexico. I'm not gonna leave, I'm not gonna talk about this from a political perspective, but I, what I want to talk about is that ultimately the reason that these indiv individuals had to leave Guatemala was because of climate change, because they had droughts that they've never experienced. These individuals could no longer farm, uh, and you know gangs were were, were you know demanding resources. These people had to leave because there was no way to eat. So this was a migration of individuals based uh, upon a change in the climate, a shift in the climate. So again, I know we'd like to say that, uh, well, you know, these people are just looking for the great uh, life in America, but they, they couldn't survive where they were living. They had to leave. And I think we've got to recognize we're going to see this more and more that people, these mass migrations of individuals, as was pre predicted by the World Watch Foundation 20 years ago, it's happening now. We are seeing the realization of uh, this book, the book that is put out by the World Watch Foundation for the past 25 years, and I read it every year. And you know, you go back to read the old issues, and and we're now living uh, that in times that were oh. This is 25 years in the future. Why do we need to pay attention to that? That's never going to come. Well, those days are now. Yeah. Uh, you know, George Orwell wrote a book called 1984, thinking that was so far in the future that he could entitle it that. There was a movie called 2001, A Space Odyssey. Well, that day would never come. Uh, you know, he wrote about this so far in the future. Those, those years have come and gone. And so, uh, you know, time marches on. When we hear about the changes in the climate that are predicted for the year 2030, that's 22 years from now. You and I are going to do another podcast then, and the world is going to be a very, very different place. Just to clarify, 12 years. 12 years. Okay. Which, that's right. Tw 13 years ago, guys, the iPhone was released. Just to give you a little bit of context, we had Alex Reich on the program recently that he runs one of the top uh, climate change and science focused YouTube channels. And I believe it was him. It might have been it might have been a paleo biontology. We, we have a lot of interesting people. But they were saying, yeah, an ice age is something about, I want to say on the order of four degrees cooler than we are today is considered ice age. I might be getting that wrong. But it's it's a very small. Well, if you're saying centigrade or Celsius, centigrade, I think. yeah. So, for for anyone that's listening, the American system's terrible. It, it everything should be Celsius and centigrade. But it's it's shocking to think that we're moving towards that, and people are either looking the other way or just not caring. Yeah. Well, I I think that um, our global society seems to be moving to a place. Uh, more connected to reptilian brain function. In other words, uh, being more impulsive and uh, reactionary as opposed to being more related to prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that really defines us as being human, where we are compassionate, empathetic, and uh, really can think about our choices, actions, and behavior uh, in the context of their consequence or benefit, uh, which is a more um, human, uh, I think, kind of behavior. And I think that there are many, many factors that are, uh, that are keeping us connected to the amygdala and more of a fear-based way of, of conducting ourselves, including uh, social media and how it has been manipulated to uh, influence our choices, uh, even higher levels of inflammation brought on by global dietary shifts uh, favor a, a reduction in our connection to the prefrontal cortex. So we default to our reptilian immediate gratification part of the brain. And that uh, type of behavior uh, doesn't consider 
uh, long-term effects of our choices day to day. Therefore, uh, you know, uh, breaking down uh, these relationships that we've had with indigenous people uh, in the Amazon basin, uh, destroying uh, the Amazon in order to grow soybeans because that's good for it's it's profitable. Uh, recognizing that diversity is not important anymore, that we should grow eight monocrops uh, around the world and that'll feed the planet. Explain why uh, that's a problem. Is, pardon me? Explain why monocrops are a problem. Well, it, diversity is what we're looking for. Uh, I'll explain why monocrops are a problem from, a, from one perspective. Uh, there are many, and that, that is a perspective of our gut bacteria. We have a more diverse gut bacteria when we eat more diverse foods. We need a more diverse gut bacteria, different types of organisms represented, much as the orchestra needs every instrument doing its part in order to really play that symphony. So for us to be resilient, for us to be able to uh, respond appropriately to various health challenges that we experience every single day in the form of toxicity or trauma, et cetera, we have to have diversity of our gut bacteria. So even from that perspective, uh, when we narrow our food choices to wheat and corn and soy, et cetera, and even uh, singular crops of those, we dramatically reduce our diversity of our gut bacteria and it damages our resilience. Similarly, when we reduce the diversity of flora and fauna, for example, in the, in the Amazon, we reduce the planet's resilience to deal with things that we are seeing now in terms of climate change. Beyond that, when uh, I, I said I wouldn't do it, but I'm going to do it uh, just for your viewers, that we, we have to understand that when we are limited to singular forms of various crops, we expose ourselves to uh, threat from um, infection, from, uh, for example, uh, insect uh, involvement in destroying those monocrops. We create a situation where we become dependent solely on crops and, you know, it's nothing short of what happened in the Irish potato famine, if you need an example. Whereas when we have diversity of crops, some might be damaged by uh, uh, insects or uh, through um, other in infestation, others will survive. And in fact, that's a bit of a Darwinian way of looking at it, is allowed us to have such an abundance of availability today in terms of foods uh, that are grown. So uh, it, it's not what is happening uh, on the planet. You know, it, and it is this notion of these monocrops is absolutely pervasive with most of these monocrops now globally being genetically modified. Uh, and uh, there was a very interesting study that came out um, six weeks ago in uh, cell host and micro by uh, Dr. Teng uh, from uh, University of Louisville uh, in Kentucky. And he demonstrated, uh, connected a couple of dots that I've been waiting for for a long time. We know that the foods we eat influence our gut bacteria. A and most of that discussion has centered upon the levels of the macronutrients, the protein, the carbohydrate, uh, and fat content of our foods and how that is leveraged by our gut bacteria, if you will, in terms of doing what they do. But Dr. Tang and his group noted that plants contain genetic material in the form of their RNA, and that in the plant cells, that is where this genetic material is stored in, in the cell of the plants, and that exosomes or particles uh, or encapsulations of plant genetic material called exosomes are released from these cells when we digest plants, and that these exosomes containing the RNA from the plant make their way into the bacteria that live within us. That exosome opens up and that RNA from the plant influences the gene expression of the RNA within the bacteria, meaning that the plants are using their RNA to influence the gene expression of the RNA of the bacteria living within us, which changes the bacteria's metabolism, it changes whether they reproduce or not, their numbers, and it changes where they locate themselves. Do they locate themselves to the gut lining and help us reduce our risk for gut leakiness, for example? Where bacteria are actually located is very important in terms of their function within the gut. So 
this is powerful inflammation uh, information that relates to how food really is information how food is sending this packet of genetic information that changes the genetics of our gut bacteria that ultimately has a huge bearing on our health, our resistance to disease, our levels of inflammation, et cetera. So it, it brings to mind a new area to consider when we think about genetically modified foods. So when research is done, and it's not a lot of research that says GMO foods are safe, most of which is animal research, it hasn't looked at how genetically modified foods change the genetic expression of the bacteria within us. And it is um, something that cannot be neglected moving forward. Now we understand that our foods are changing our uh, gene, gene expression within our bacteria. The other part of that story that we have known about for a long time is, well, why do we have GMO foods? Uh, you know, the notion was, well, because that's how we can feed the starving planet. And th the truth of that matter is that uh, we've kind of seen the end of that promise. That that's not actually what's happening. Uh, that production through genetic modification is now stab uh, stabilized and is actually declining. But the reason, by and large, that we have GMO food is so that farmers can spray their crops with uh, pes pesticides and herbicides, more importantly, like glyphosate, to kill uh, the weeds. The corn will grow. The soil will grow. You spray it with weeds. What does that do? Well, it kills the, uh, the weeds. It kills the bacteria living in the soil, which have nurtured plants. Uh, for as long as there have been plants. They have a relationship with bacteria like you and I do. And beyond that, we get traces of this uh, herbicide on the food that we eat. And we know from researchers like Dr. Stephanie Sten uh, Senef at MIT that the residual amounts of this glyphosate on the food that is GMO foods is damaging to our own gut bacteria directly beyond just this indirect connection through gene modification, so which is purported. I will be the one to purport that today. Uh, so we know there's a direct effect upon our uh, the microbiome in terms of changing its functionality. So, uh, you know, we have to take this stuff very, very seriously and think about one of the primary tenets of being a medical doctor, and that is primum non nocere, above all, do no harm. We think we have to apply that to this whole notion of global genetic modification of the very food that we eat. I want to I want to follow up with that with a, a devil's advocate question to get okay. your answer, but in a completely non-political way. So based off of the science and based off of my understanding, the only thing we can positively say is that the application of uh, pesticides and herbicides leads to the essentially death of bacteria on the plants and negative implications when human beings consume those plants because most likely some traces are still left over and they're not getting the bacteria and the nutrients from the soil. I don't see a reasonable reason to assume that genetically modifying a plant, if you weren't to spray these pesticides and herbicides, would inherently make that plant less healthy or valuable than another plant, assuming they were grown in the same soil organically without the same, without fertilizers or anything. Is that a fair assumption to make? I feel like GMOs get politicized, not because of the reasons why they should be, which is the use of the pesticides and herbicides and much more because of the, the term genetically modified in a, in a anti-science kind of ways, how I see it thrown about much more frequently. So for instance, near by all bananas that we eat are genetically modified. We've crossbred them for properties. All dogs that we have are genetically modified with them. We've crossbred them to have babies with each other. A lot of the fruits and vegetables that we eat, same exact deal. Flowers, the same exact deal. Is the line scientific or is it moral? Well, um, respectfully, uh, I would indicate that hybridization, which is what has happened in dogs and bananas uh, and everything you've mentioned, 
trying to create a better breed of garden pea or, or a doodle something dog, whatever, uh, is, is not the same as inserting a non-plant gene into a plant. When you uh, crossbreed uh, organisms that are similar, hence they're able to crossbreed, uh, that is a process that occurs in nature and may be consequential in both a positive or negative way. Uh, we've been hybridizing plants for a long, long time, like wheat, for example, making it uh, grow more quickly so it can be harvested earlier, uh, it has changed the gluten availability, et cetera. But that's in no way uh, the same thing as inserting a specific gene into the genome of uh, corn that allows it to be resistant to uh, an herbicide or rice that uh, allows it to uh, have a higher level of a vitamin in it, for example, which might be considered to be positive. So there, there may be an upside to that, but please understand that uh, this isn't a natural process by any means. This is a technological process, uh, the long-term consequences of which we do not understand. Now, to get to the nutrient quality of GMO versus non-GMO, we can take a step back and recognize that non-GMO paves the way for a healthier planet by reducing uh, the production and utilization of poisons. Fair enough. I mean, that, that I think we could say the broad stroke there is that that would be a healthier planet where the runoff doesn't get into our drinking water. But that's, assuming, that's, the assuming, that's assuming that if you decide to plant genetically modified crops, you're going to have special special fertilizers and herbicides, which isn't necessary. Yes, and, uh, and that said, uh, that's truthfully, by and large, why we have GMO crops. Most of them are GMO for uh, that allow that. And, and think about it. The people who bring you those GMO seeds are the manufacturers of the very chemicals that you will then need to use. So this is vertically indicated, integrated. They control the seed that then requires you use their chemical to kill the weeds. So, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing. What I see a lot is that people are able to put off the movement. Essentially, people are able to wave their hands at the GMO movement and say, these are the anti-science guys, because the reason why people give for something being bad isn't a reason. It's a fact. And the fact is a result of a previous step, the previous step being the problem. If you were to just genetically modify an organism, for instance, plants, there's no inherent reason why that would be worse than other plants. There are certainly reasons why it could be better. There are certainly reasons why it could be worse. But people are able to say that's an irrelevant reason because it looks like you're against science versus saying this is a compelling reason which science does support. Does that you're make exactly sense? You're exactly right. The, the, the second step that is dreadfully important, however, is the connection then to the use of glyphosate. That's the big leap that uh, allows me, when people say, uh, uh, anybody here uh, uh, think that GMO uh, foods are a bad idea, that's why I get to raise my hand in that situation. Not because we have a, a robust science that indicates that that specific action of genetically modifying that seed is inherently bad, but it's what it paves the way for. And it paves the way for the destruction of the soil on our planet. And I think that's, uh, that re relationship is something people need to embrace. Uh, and, and truly, uh, the first step, GMO, is it bad or good, is an unanswered question. But I do believe that the question should be answered uh, more aggressively, i.e. more science, prior to allowing this to have happened globally. And it didn't. And now that we have this new research that just came out from Dr. Tang and his group from University of Louisville, I mentioned earlier, that the genes from plants do escape and influence the microbes in our gut, it brings a new level to our understanding or lack of understanding of this relationship that we need to factor in. Let me make one more point, and that is genetically modified uh, crops, by definition, are not going to be uh, qualified as being organic. And you know, there's been a lot of debate over the years, uh, should I buy organic foods, is it good for me? Uh, there's not a lot of interventional trials that, in humans, uh, obviously. Uh, there certainly are in animals that indicate organic is better. But a large study was published six weeks ago, uh, carried out in France. As fate would have it, I was in France when it was published. But uh, it was a study uh, that demonstrated 
it was a very, I think it was an eight year study, 70,000 individuals. And it showed that there was overall about a 25% reduced risk of cancer, including breast, uh, uh, prostate, uh, colorectal, lymphoma, and uh, non-Hodgkin's, yeah, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in individuals who chose to favor, not totally dedicate to, but who chose to eat more organic food as opposed to those who didn't pay attention to it. So, you know, that's a correlative study. It's not a cause and effect relationship. But for me, in terms of the recommendations in my messaging, I have to pay attention to correlative studies because I think they give out valuable information. This is a very, very large study. So uh, when we understand that poisoning the soil and killing the bacteria in the soil by spraying it with glyphosate has an effect on the nutrient uh, density in the plant food and in what the plants are able to assimilate, that would tend also to argue uh, in favor of not using poison on our food because it damages the soil on which they are, which our plant crops are grown. I would, so I would uh, agree for multiple with all reasons. I would agree with all of that. I think the study, at least, I, I'll point it out because plenty of people would be willing to point it out. The study would be inherently flawed because the type of people that would opt for eating without organic a, are, question. are already much healthier. They're already exercising. They have more they money. They did their very best to mm-hmm. tease that out. Seventy-two uh, percent of the people in the study were women because mm-hmm. uh, they are the ones who consented to participate. That should tell you something. And so that the the numbers of cancers that were seen were by and large breast cancer being highly represented. Doesn't mean that eating uh, less organically is gonna increase everyone's risk for breast cancer, but that's what it showed because it was skewed. I would agree with you. I think that uh, the people who participated showed higher levels of uh, education and therefore were more likely to make other lifestyle choices that were better for them the study did its very best to uh, screen for those things, but it was not perfect. I would agree with you. Have there been any that looked instead at the results of disease, which I believe to be very flawed because it's something that has an exponential curve over time? These individuals were already going to get sick. It's just a question of when. Looking at instead biomarkers, so looking at um, even biomarkers, the ones you would measure would be tough to agree on, but cholesterol. Is there, is there a good way to measure inflammation in the brain or the body? Oh, absolutely. Well, uh, we can measure certain blood parameters uh, that are are very much related, can serve as surrogates. You know, you're not going to do a brain biopsy or do a spinal tap on people. But uh, oddly enough, one of the best that people are already having done is called the A1C, a measure of their average blood sugar. Who knew? There's a direct relationship between your average blood sugar that every diabetic knows about that you see advertised on TV uh, in the evening news, I've got to lower my A1C. Uh, A1C is a powerful indicator of the level of inflammation in your body. Uh, There are more specific markers. We can measure things like TNF-alpha, certainly highly sensitive C-reactive protein are more in line with inflammation, but even your blood sugar, your average blood sugar and your A1C are, in a sense, powerful surrogate markers for the level of inflammation in your body. I wanted to bring it up earlier when you mentioned people becoming more rash with their decisions, part of that being blood sugar spikes. I know that's right up your alley. Well, uh, yeah, I I think that, um, you know, it gets back to the paleo argument that we should really consider the messaging of the paleo movement Uh, in a nutshell, is that we should do our very best to emulate the the lifestyle choices of our Paleolithic ancestors because that's the genome that we uh, continue to uh, express. And that, as you talked about earlier, these epigenetic modifiers, how we change the expression of our genome based upon things like the foods we eat, which I will say, Matt, was not something I learned in medical school because we thought DNA was, you know, locked up in a glass case. So it's newer science. But that said, Uh, As it relates to blood sugar, uh, I think that we really should consider that it's not likely that our Paleolithic ancestors had high levels of blood sugar or had the blood sugar spikes that most people experience these days. Uh, And it's these higher levels of blood sugar that ultimately lead to our bodies developing resistance to an important hormone called insulin, which is really front and center 
uh, in terms of brain degenerative conditions and uh, other things uh, involving the heart, uh, cardiovascular disease, and uh, even uh, obviously diabetes and even forms of cancer. I think something that most people could agree on is if you're shopping at the grocery store, stay on the outsides. Don't buy anything that comes in a box or a bag. Um, pretty much. Pretty much. I, I not, say, not completely. And, certain things you don't have a choice, yeah, but I mean, in general. Yeah. Uh, I buy bags of mushrooms, so I, they're not. But I would say uh, right off the bat, be a little bit suspicious of an ingredient list. Uh, you know, you want to have something that has very few ingredients. And by all means, uh, if it has more than five ingredients in it, it means by nature, it, uh, not by nature, by virtue of the, that fact, it's been processed. And beyond that, if there's anything on that list that you can't identify or pronounce, that's not food. Um, you know, I, we talked before about the health food store. What a bonkers notion that we have some stores that sell food that could somehow be related to your health. But most stores are not health food stores. What in the heck is this stuff? Well, if we look at food as information, just from that perspective, not is this gluten free, is it have high levels of omega-6 fats, on and on. Just in terms of inform information, this is what is targeting not only your DNA, but the genetic material of your gut bacteria. I think uh, embracing that idea really will make you take you away from your primitive brain and by default have you activate your prefrontal cortex where you will at least stop and say, you know, I learned about something on a podcast. I read a book. Uh, I heard somebody speak. I went to a lecture and I want to cue that tape right now and make better choices. If it is, Matt, as you just said, shopping the periphery of the grocery store, then that is a good place to start. And if you're skeptical about any of this, go scoop three scoops of sugar into a cup and drink it and tell me how you feel afterwards. How do you feel eat. about clean meat and the, the future of lab-grown meat, which would well, that, really be our only option in space? Too. And uh, let's start with clean meat. Uh, my messaging over the years has been uh, anything but uh, an Atkins redux, which nonetheless people have, have thought grain brain and its messaging was. Uh, but... I do believe that for people who uh, choose not to be vegetarians, that uh, if they choose to eat meat, that it absolutely should be grass-fed, organically raised beef, that fish should be wild, that uh, chicken should be free-range. Why? Uh, because I, I will absolutely uh, confirm my belief in the statistics, for example, that demonstrate a relationship between um, red meat consumption and, for example, colorectal cancer, as was uh, wonderfully uh, described in the China study by uh, Dr. Uh, Campbell. And I'd say that relationship holds because, by and large, red meat is something you should not eat because, by and large, that red meat comes from these factory farms where these animals are given hormones, antibiotics, and, yes, fed the very genetically modified glyphosate-sprayed foods that we've just talked about which changes their microbiome and will change the consumer's microbiome as well. Uh, if people choose to eat grass-fed beef uh, in moderation, a day or two a week, uh, so be it. I think that is not necessarily an inappropriate choice for that person. I will indicate that uh, as I move forward in life, uh, I am moving more and more towards a plant-based program. Um, Suzanne, uh, uh, I can't remember her last name, Cameron, who uh, has just written a book called OMD, One Meal a Day. And her push is to, uh, for people to understand why not have a plant-based meal one, for one meal a day, make that your choice for one meal a day. And hey, why not? I think the more we move towards that, I think the better. Uh, I was able over the years to argue my way out of being a vegetarian by saying that, you know, if you're careful with it, it is sustainable to eat meat on and on. But uh, as I, uh, you know, I've indicated, I think it's good to reassess your messaging, personal messaging. What's, what am I doing for myself? And in my case, therefore, what it is I talk to you about over the years and make decisions not only based upon science, but based upon what I feel is the right decision from 
beyond a scientific perspective, but what feels right, uh, not just for myself, but for others, uh, others that are I'm sharing the planet with, and therefore moving more towards a plant-based diet. It's definitely a compromise between health and sustainability. I would say a lot of those, a lot of the studies showing meat consumption tied to cancer, I would almost completely throw out because if the person's eating Snickers and candy and yada yada with that, then there's we've already established what happens when you spike blood sugar and have that. Then it's a different story. I think uh, I think well, you it's know you do spike blood pressure, uh, blood sugar rather, when you have a lot of protein hanging around. A and B, you know, we're beginning to understand. Um, just what higher levels, which tends to be favored by more carnivorous-based diets, uh, do uh, from a gene expression perspective. So, uh, you know, mediated through what's called uh, mTOR, uh, but we do see higher levels of free radical production uh, and inflammatory markers. Uh, there are some changes in the gut uh, uh, with higher levels of something called uh, trimethylamine oxide that is a bacterial product. Uh, with higher levels of protein consumption, specifically animal product protein consumption. So uh, I think, uh, you know, I've kind of discounted that science from a self-serving perspective over the years because I liked to eat more meat than I think now is appropriate. So uh, has my messaging changed? Yep, it has. And I'm doing the best I can uh, with, with learning as much as I can and getting that information out to as many people as I can. And that messaging will very likely and hopefully change as we move forward. Which is critically important. If you see someone who ever does not change their messaging, especially when new science comes in, you know you found a, you found a nut. You found a, a, someone with much too much faith and not enough, uh, not enough understanding. So one, two last questions before we wrap up. What technology are you most excited with coming in the next 5, 10, 20 years and why? Uh, and uh, I think it, it alludes to what we had talked about earlier. I, I am very taken by the application of artificial intelligence and big data coming together, uh, allowing us to have a very, very great understanding in terms of what the data for the individual means. And I'll explain how that extrapolates in a moment. So in other words, being able to uh, work with large amounts of data to understand what we can then bring back to the individual in terms of specific recommendations for the individual. So how big data and artificial intelligence are going to influence personalized medicine and how that evolves over the next five, 10 and, uh, years and beyond. And, and in addition, what we learn from this information to then be able to generalize to the population at, at large. What, do we learn from this data that we can then leverage in terms of our overall general typical uh, recommendations that we also make? So well beyond the personalized medicine. So that's that's what I'm most excited about moving forward. Yeah, it's super interesting. I actually just did a just did a DNA test specifically focused on what you should be eating. And I'll try to get you guys some type of coupon code if you go to disruptors.fm slash DNA the company's nutrition genome. And I found out things like I don't process uh, omega threes from plants very well. And my body can only tolerate or needs more. There's I have a ton of things on there that I need to kind of look into. Cause I think this personalized optimization is important. Some people think it's, it's weird, but if you're able to get a couple percentage improvement over yourself, that's exponential. Over Why time. not? Yeah. My last question for you, David, if you had to leave people with one thing, a quote, a call to action and, whatever it can be, before you tell them about where to find you and all that good stuff, what would it be? Well, I would say that, you know, we know that our thoughts determine our actions. But I think the thought I would like to leave with your viewers is, in a very real sense, our actions determine how we think, our thoughts. So when we choose to act in a certain way, it affects our brain wiring and makes our brains, allows our brains to work differently, to view the world differently. So we can actually rewire our brains to be more considerate, more empathetic, more concerned with the future by engaging in activities that cultivate that type of brain. Yeah, that's a, it's a super valuable takeaway. Your brain is, the best metaphor I've heard, your brain is like a snowy hill. The more times you go down a path, the deeper it gets and the harder it is to get out of the rut. 
Okay, I'm there. Where's the best place to find you, David? I know you've got some good books. I know you've got some websites. What's up? Well, let me tell you, um, Grain Brain is the book I wrote, uh, published five years ago, is now uh, in 34 languages, but has just been fully revised uh, after five years. All the science has been updated. Uh, we've talked about what science we covered in the first book and now how more science has validated that, what, what we've learned. So that's available, uh, it's uh, the Grain Brain Revised Edition. Um, on my website, which is a great place to go, I believe, is oddly enough, drperlmutter.com, drperlmutter.com. And it's fully searchable. We have thousands of peer-reviewed scientific studies available in their full PDF form, uh, searchable by topic. We uh, will send out to all of our readers a free newsletter every week. So that's drperlmutter.com. I think that's probably the best place to follow me. Sweet. We'll put links and everything in the show notes, guys. Disruptors.fm. And because I know you're someone who is willing to change with the science, what are the two biggest changes from the earliest book to the revised book? Uh, I'd say probably no uh, dramatic uh, uh, change that is uh, totally uh, in not in line with what we said. I think the biggest issues have been the degree of validation, uh, the level of science underlying what we've talked about. And, you know, I can't say that things went in a, in a direction that we weren't expecting. So uh, I think that the biggest, uh, the biggest surprises were, have been the degree of uh, validation where people have really, you know, come online with understanding that, you know, we talked about how, how wheat, carbs, and sugar were toxic and now you know just this you know robust literature that we're able to utilize and and quote uh, that has been so supportive of that notion and the other surprise is i think the number of clinicians who are uh, implementing these uh these these ideas uh and the also the amplification of the whole uh, idea that being on a ketogenic type of diet is really something very positive that's really taken off Oh, it's been incredible. I, I've done it for a while and I'll be switching back to it. Just the mental, I didn't do it to lose weight, just the mental performance boost of feeling like Superman. That, that was something I would recommend to everyone to try out. No one's going to argue with that. No one's going to argue with that. And uh, it boosts your energy output later in life. Thanks for coming today, David. This has been fun. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. Sweet. Cheers, guys.